This is Dolio, an original thriller fiction podcast, presented in serialized format, one chapter at a time. Written by Jared Canton, narrated by Joshua Canton, a Steady Chaos production, all rights reserved, 2019, prologue. The most shocking element of the scene before her was not the thick pool of blood puddled beneath her newly adopted son, nor was it the fact that the handle of her fabric scissors protruded from his abdomen. It was the tranquility painted upon his face. It was the blood on his hands and the blood on the wall that carefully crafted the first three letters of his name, R, Y, D. It was his indescribable calmness. He grinned. She panicked. Ryder, Lee exclaimed as she collapsed into the sticky pool of blood. The bottom of her bathrobe dragged in the thick fluid, floundering like an overwhelmed mop head. She dared not touch him out of fear that his calmness would turn to panic, that he'd further aggravate his wound, or worse, fade away. Ryder pointed to the wall. Ryder, he said with pride, gesturing to the first three letters of his name. As his arm rose aloft, the scissor handle quivered, and Lee felt a knot ascend into her throat. He wasn't crying. Why wasn't he crying? Dexterity betrayed her as her index finger jabbed at the glowing digits on the cordless phone. 911, what is your emergency? A monotone voice bellowed through the earpiece. My son, oh my god, my son stabbed himself, she cried as her words fragmented by short bursts of breath. The words, my son, still felt foreign, almost surreal. Ma'am, stay calm, what's the address so we can get a crew out to you as soon as possible? Um, Lee's mind blanked. We just moved here. She ran to the kitchen counter. Her trembling hands tore through piles of paperwork seeking the U.S. Post Office change of address form she had completed earlier that day. She fought for balance as her tennis shoes stamped a trail of bloody footprints across the kitchen's yellow linoleum floor. Her left foot lost traction, and her leg shot outward, slamming into the oak shelving below the countertops. Damn it, she cried in frustration and pain. They had wanted children, and finally, an adopted son. And not thirty-six hours after taking him into their home... He's waiting in a pool of his own blood on her floor. How could she let this happen? Could she even be a mother? Did God make her this way, incapable of natural motherhood, because he knew she wasn't fit? Are you there? "Uh Uh-huh, Lee cried in a high-pitched whine. Remain calm, ma'am. Everything will be fine. What's your name? Lee Dolio. Her hand sifted hurriedly through the envelopes on the countertop while her ear pinched the phone to her shoulder. Found it. Go ahead. 180 Newton Street, Danvers. Please hurry. There's so much blood, and he's so little. Help is on the way, ma'am. Can you just answer a few questions for me? I need some more information from you. Yeah, sure. I can. Lee rushed back to Ryder's side and slid onto her knees. The blood methodically enveloped her, surrounding her crouched body like a crimson moat. Ryder's face had fallen pale. His eyelids drooped heavily, but he still hadn't cried. Not a whimper, just a far-off stare. She wanted to fall under him, be his foundation, but she didn't dare. Her hand fell gently on his knee opposite the wound. Ryder slumped his head back so he could peer up at her from beneath sagging eyelids. He smiled. Although baffling, it was a smile that melted all doubts. If motherhood was love, then a mother she was intended to be. Ryder was perfect, and he looked at her with the passion she always dreamed her child would, as if she were the only person of consequence in the world. Even as he now sat, bleeding, life pouring from his veins, he delivered that look and all that it carried. How old is your son? Four. Lee cupped Ryder's head to keep it from falling to the side. Ryder! Ryder! She repeated. He didn't respond. Is anyone there with you? No. My husband works late. It's just us. Please. Please help us. We adopted... uh, We just brought him home yesterday. I'm an awful mother. Saying the words aloud made them no less true and made them cut even more deeply. Is your son conscious, ma'am? Barely. He, he's bleeding so much. Her voice trailed off into a high-pitched sob. What did he stab himself with? Scissors. Where? His stomach. Left side. What does your house look like, ma'am? There's blood. So much blood. No, the outside, I mean. They're almost there. It's a red cape. Are there any cars in the driveway? One. Blue Civic. When the paramedics arrived, did they have permission to enter? Of course, Lee said as the front door exploded inward. Two men in a stretcher stormed through her living room. Please, ma'am, the first man said, ushering her to the side with two hands on her shoulders. Does he have any medical conditions, allergies, hemophilia? No, I don't think so, no. She recalled the charts at the adoption agency. The agency had labeled Ryder curiously healthy. 
The man leaned forward, the fingers on his left hand carved into the boy's neck, seeking a pulse. It's faint, he announced. Lee watched as the other man rummaged through a kit overflowing with various tubes, tapes, masks, and wires. He found what he was looking for and swiftly cut Ryder's shirt off, carefully maneuvering around the wound without impacting it. Let's move, the man said with the kit. The men secured Ryder's diminutive body to the stretcher. Before they could wheel him out of the kitchen, the man holding the kit turned back. Ma'am, are you coming in the ambulance? She said nothing. Her eyes fixated on the blood, which at this point had spread or stamped its way into every part of the kitchen and adjoining living room. What would the adoption agency say if Ryder died? What would everyone say? If he lived, would they take him from her? She had waited so long just to lose him this quickly. Ma'am, we have to go. The voice floated around her. She raised her eyes to its source. With her bloodied right hand, she pushed bangs from the front of her face, dragging a thin layer of blood across her forehead and up into her hair. She stood, unsteady, and buckled before two strong arms caught her. Hi, honey. Uh, hi, Lee said. She opened her eyes to blinding whiteness, an unfamiliar room, and the image of her ever-nervous husband, Mark, stroking her hand. Where? She stammered. Leahy, Mark said, brushing her hair back from her face. What? She asked. Her eyes panned the room curiously. There was too much white, and the unnatural light from above reflected off of it all at once, concentrating it into a blinding beam that seemingly ripped into her eyes and out the back of her head. Ryder he said, coaxing her to finish her thought. Oh, Christ, she shot up in bed as a flood of memories washed over her. Easy, everything's fine, he's stable. I need to see him. Actually, the doctor requested to speak with us first. You feel up to it? He held his wife's elbow as she immediately swung her feet off the side of the bed. Did he say why? She already knew. It's not every day a boy stabs himself in the stomach on his mother's watch. Don't run with scissors. She had always thought the adage more fodder for overprotective mothers than legitimate threat. She stood painfully corrected. I'm sure it's policy to let us know his status, how to move forward, or to condemn me. Tears lined her lower eyelids. Honey, it's not your fault. Kids fall. She shook her head as she climbed the final few feet upright from the bed to her feet. It'll be fine. Come on. Mark led her out the door towards the office the nurse had directed him to visit earlier. He knocked three times, and a deep voice from inside invited them into the room. Please, please, the man said. He motioned his hands calmly in the direction of two chairs at the front of his desk. Can we see him? Lee asked. In a moment, the doctor's desk housed a small, tent-style name placard identifying him as James Anderson, M.D., Oncology. Ryder is a fascinating young man, Dr. Anderson said. Child, Lee corrected hastily. The word oncology following the doctor's name on the placard sent her mind spiraling down a dangerous path of possibilities. We know, Mark replied with a gentle nod to both Lee and Dr. Anderson. I guess my first question is... And please, don't mistake this for an inquisition, because I assure you that's not my intention. Is how this happened? Lee shot a told-you-so look towards Mark. Does Ryder have cancer? She had withheld the question only seconds, but it felt like a lifetime of restraint. No, no. Oncology is but one of many hats. Ryder does not have cancer. Lee exhaled and her imagination retreated to a safer place. With her family history, any place absent the word cancer was a safer place. Let's back up to my initial question. How exactly did Ryder hurt himself? He was running with my sewing scissors. You were in the room to observe this. Well, no. Did you even see him running? No, I guess not. Then how do you know he fell while running? Did you miss the scissors in his stomach part? Lee fired back. She knew he had to get to the bottom of this, and that entailed inquiries she may find distasteful. But this line of questioning felt trivial. Ma'am, like I said, this isn't an interrogation. I just need facts. Please, no conjecture. If you didn't see it, then just say so. No. I didn't see it, she shot back towards Mark. She often communicated with him via a look. This was the look she used to prod his timid personality to life. What's this about? Mark cut in, rather obtusely, before Lee could direct another scathing glance his way. How long were you out of the room? Lee exhaled an audible puff of frustration. I left him in the kitchen for maybe five minutes, long enough to grab some thread from upstairs. Five minutes to get thread? I peed, too. She rolled her eyes and scoffed. Her embarrassment, combined with the doctor's insinuation, had compelled her to defend herself the best way she knew how. Sarcasm. Mark had never warmed to her tendency to react this way, and she suspected the doctor wouldn't either. Where were the scissors? I thought this was an interrogation, Mark said. Bear with me. On the table, Lee played along begrudgingly. And how far from the table was Ryder when you found him? Lee paused. About two feet? Then why would we assume he was running? Dr. Anderson probed. Maybe he wasn't, I guess. 
Lee admitted she couldn't truly be certain. The depth of his wound suggests limited force, and that is the only reason he didn't bleed to death. She was confused. Was this conversation designed solely to torment her further than she herself already had? Ma'am, I think your son stabbed himself. I think we've already established that. She flipped her hair from her face with a jerky, violent motion, as if swatting a persistent fly. Intentionally, Dr. Anderson completed the puzzle. What? Why would you possibly think that? Lee looked towards Mark, then back to the doctor. It's utterly absurd. He has a green stick fracture on his right leg consistent with a childhood fall from an elevated position. So yes, I think he did climb atop, grab the scissors, and subsequently jump from the table. However, the controlled stab wound pattern suggests that is not when he stabbed himself. The angle and depth suggest he stabbed himself with a limited force of, say, a four-year-old's thrust. Why? Lee paused. Why would he do that? He's just a kid. She pushed her hair back from her face again. The news, although horrifying, temporarily mitigated her sense of dread. She felt somehow less responsible, less negligent. She let the relief it brought her fill her and push out the once consuming regret. This was not her burden to bear. This was a child that had harmed himself. No mother could prevent such an act. When you found Ryder, was he crying? Dr. Anderson asked. No, I guess he was in shock. Was he sweating? No. Fast shallow breaths. No, he was calm, almost peaceful. Were his lips blue? No. Then it probably wasn't shock, Dr. Anderson said. His facial expression reeked of condescension, even if of the unintended variety. She was used to knowing more than those around her, and it was why she hated doctors. In this setting and area of study, they always knew more. Then what was it? Mark asked. Confusion? Awe? Curiosity? He was curious that he stabbed himself? I've heard just about enough of this. Lee stood, the back of her knee center chair skidding backwards. Let me explain. Dr. Anderson stood, pushing the air down with both palms. Lee paused, exhaled, and returned to her seat with a huff. I may have approached this insensitively. I just couldn't risk a lot of what I'm about to tell you to taint your previous answers. Give it to us straight, Mark said. He had said remarkably little, a quality of his that Lee had found endearing when they first met, and now, when she needed him most, enraging. We had to give your son a transfusion and a tetanus shot. He also managed to pull several stitches free within the first few minutes after waking from surgery. And? Lee asked. There was nothing earth-shattering in the doctor's revelations. She had seen it all before on an evening rerun of ER. It's not what he did so much, it's more what he didn't do. You see, an average four-year-old finds all the things I just mentioned not only terrifying, but extremely painful. Ryder experienced neither fear nor pain. Are you saying my son's invincible? Mark forced through a contrived laugh. No, not at all. In fact, a few inches left or right and he very well could have died from this incident. He can most definitely be hurt, he just can't feel it. What? Lee exclaimed in astonishment. I'm fairly certain your son suffers from a condition called congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. That means... Lee understood the base suggestion, that Ryder couldn't feel pain, but the further implications were pure mystery. CIPA, or CIPA we'll call it, is essentially a genetic mutation that renders the human brain incapable of processing pain communications from the body. In addition to the body's inability to process pain, anhydrosis renders the brain incapable of monitoring temperature. As such, if Ryder were to place his hands in a fire, he wouldn't react. Furthermore, he would be completely unaware of severe fever or even impending hypothermia. But the agency said he was healthy, Mark said. That's what I find particularly exceptional about Ryder. Most children that suffer from SIPA show serious injuries from teething until diagnosis. They break their teeth on their own jaw bones, scratch their eyes beyond repair, break bones, burn themselves. Their bodies encounter illness that, accompanied by severe fever, can cause mental retardation before doctors can even make a diagnosis. And Ryder? Lee rested her hand on Mark's knee, not certain she could handle the answer to this question without physical connection with someone. And for the moment, he'd have to do. Ryder does have healed injuries consistent with his illness. It appears he suffered other fractures in addition to his newest fracture. His teeth are worn, consistent with grinding, and he does have oral abrasion scars. However, his brain function and scans are normal. He doesn't appear to suffer from any mental deficiencies or retardation. Much to the contrary, he's a very bright boy. Can he live a normal life? The whirlwind of the day had begun to take a toll on her. Lee rested her face in her hands, exhaled into her palms, and her hot breath beat back into her face. Her breath was potent. Not much is known about Sippa. However, much of what we do know stems from cases in Japan. For some reason, Japan's homogeneous population... 
English, please? Lee interjected. Her emotions had taxed an already exhausted mind, and the doctor's monologue had begun to merge into a bitter blend of complex multisyllabic words. I'm sorry, he laughed in awkward transition. You see, Japan, unlike the United States, is comprised of almost one culture and race, Japanese. Whereas we have blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians, and so on, they're mostly just Japanese. For some reason, this leads the small island nation to demonstrate an inordinate amount of SIPA cases as compared to the United States or, say, Europe. How does this impact Ryder? Lee looked angrily at the doctor. His demeanor was almost that of excitement, as if her son's misfortune had gifted him a shiny new toy to play with. A study in Japan examined 50 patients suffering from SIPA. Of those 50 between the ages of 4 and 30, over 90% had mild to severe mental retardation experienced in early life. Of the three that didn't, all shared at least a few common characteristics. First, all three ran a naturally low body temperature, which would explain the absence of brain damage. You see, if body temperature is naturally low, it would theoretically take an intense fever to bring it up to dangerous levels. Secondly, two of the three demonstrated tactile hyperesthesia, which is simply put a heightened sense of touch. Thirdly, one experienced heightened titillation, which is increased sensitivity to light touch. And lastly, one of the three demonstrated fully functional, normal, joint structure and durability. Normal joint structure? The way Lee had observed him playing before the adoption had never indicated joint problems. In retrospect, knowing what she now does, the blatant disregard Ryder showed for his body as he ran about had now begun to make sense. That is the fascinating thing about Ryder. He not only shares a few of the apparently positive characteristics I just mentioned, he has them all. And that means he could develop normally? Mark pulled at his lower right pant leg, crossing the leg across his left knee. As hard as she presumed he was trying, his attempts to look cool were betrayed by his tendency to fidget maddeningly in times of anxiety. Lee flattened her hand on his back and left it there, unsure whether she was doing so as a comfort or warning. Concretely, it means nothing. All we know is that right now, his body is above average for a normal child his age. He has good bone density, muscle mass, joint range, and strength in all major joints including his hips, which are usually a source of concern for SIPA sufferers. His IQ is well above average from what I could tell, and from my brief conversation with him after surgery, his vocabulary is advanced for his age. Wait, you gave him an IQ test? Lee thought the test frivolous at a time like this. I'm sorry, I would have asked your permission, but you were still unconscious. Dr. Anderson smiled. It was a contrived excuse Lee knew, but she couldn't find a justification to press the issue. How do you test the IQ of a four-year-old? Mark asked. Well, you can't really test it precisely, but you can decipher a range. A well-known Columbia University researcher, Walter Mischkel, developed a test where he put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old and told her that if she waited for him to come back into the room before eating the marshmallow, he would give the child an additional marshmallow. Twenty years later, the children that waited had more educational and professional success than those that did not. These same people also generally demonstrated higher IQs. Ryder waited, didn't he? Lee already knew the answer to her question. Yes, and when I brought him the second marshmallow and left, he still didn't eat it. When the nurse came back, he asked for a total of four marshmallows. Why four? Why not three? Mark appeared dumbstruck. Because when he had one and waited, two things occurred. First, the obvious. One marshmallow increased by one to a total of two. Under this theory, he'd be rewarded one additional marshmallow for each period of waiting. However, Ryder's pattern recognition skills are so advanced that he actually identified a more favorable pattern. When he had one marshmallow and waited, the total marshmallows doubled to two. Thus, when he had two marshmallows and waited, the total should double again, and that meant four marshmallows. It's a true stroke of genius for a child his age. It was all too much. Lee couldn't process how such a smart child could stab himself with scissors. It was impossible to organize in her mind how she, someone born with the ability to feel pain, which now seemed like a gift, could understand what a child with no warning to danger must think. I guess we just need to know if he's going to be alright. There is an amazing amount of work that goes into parenting a child with SIPA. Consider this, you're walking down the beach and you step on a sharp stone. What do you do? She'd curse, probably at me, Mark nodded towards Lee, saw his quip fall on deaf ears, and recoiled back into himself. I don't curse. What I was getting at is, the doctor paused, you would let your leg buckle and take the weight off of it. He wouldn't, which makes children with SIPA much more likely to worsen even minor injuries. On top of that, as we've witnessed firsthand tonight, they are more likely to self-mutilate for various, often inconceivable reasons. 
They suffer and understand no ill effects, and on top of that they get considerable attention returns by harming themselves. He has clearly shown a willingness to do harm to himself. We both work. We've never had children, and 36 hours after taking Ryder home, this happens. Do you think we're equipped to deal with this? What would be best for Ryder? Lee reached out for Mark's hand as she asked the question. It was a question that came straight from her objective and rational brain, and drove violently into her long-time desires to be a parent, to love a child. It was an inquiry from a soul that now saw marriage very differently than it had when she and Mark first fell in love. She wondered, under the stress of this condition, would the varnish of being a parent wear off as quickly as it had worn off being a wife. I think Ryder demonstrates qualities that strongly suggest he could thrive. He could learn and grow normally, or better, and there is no reason to believe he can't be taught to appreciate invisible threats. Children under two prove much harder to teach such things. That's great news, Mark said. It's good news, Dr. Anderson corrected. Lee interpreted his suddenly darkening demeanor as a caution flag she couldn't ignore. Ryder is going to need significant one-on-one -on -one attention. You are both professionals, accomplished, educated, and consequently, busy. You need to ask yourself if you are ready for this challenge, truly ready for a lifetime of potentially grueling and demanding parenting. What are you implying? The turtle shell Lee had carried on her back since childhood emerged defensively. I'm not implying. My job is not to imply. My job is to simply inform. This child may need a special school, special medical treatment, special equipment to protect himself from. Dr. Anderson raised in his chair and adjusted his coat. If the agency knew he had SIPA, they would have deemed Ryder 100% unadoptable. This is how significant this obligation is. Lee looked at Mark, and he returned her gaze. He shrugged. Can you give us a minute? She asked. Rage overtook her rational side. Sure. After three long strides, the doctor closed the door gently behind him. What the hell does that mean? Lee pushed her husband hard at the front of his left shoulder. What does what mean? He recoiled with alarm. You friggin' shrugged. I, I know. Well, what does it mean? I don't know. You don't know. Lee stood and stormed to the far side of the office before turning to face her cowering husband, her cheeks burning red, and her hand shook as she raised a finger to him. I've made every important decision in this marriage for the past eight years. Well, no more. I won't let you shrug your way through life. Not this. Not now. I I'm sorry. No, you're not. I know what you want to do. You've made up your mind. You just hope I act for you so you don't have to have him on your conscience. Th that's not true. It is, but not this time. I came into the kitchen to find a four-year-old boy finger-painting in his own blood. Can you imagine? Can you? Her words ripped right over his as he tried to speak. Uh, please, Mark stood, a feeble attempt to even the playing field. I shrugged because I, I don't know what to do, what to say. Of course you don't, but I won't make it easy for you this time. I'll tell you this. I am not leaving my practice. So either you become a stay-at-home dad, or we relinquish adoptive rights. Lee, please, let's talk about this. Make your decision and make the call. I'm going home. I can't deal with this. She stormed out of the room and into the glow of the hospital hallway, then past Dr. Anderson. Did you make your decision? Dr. Anderson asked. She turned to face him in full stride. Ask Mark. Tears carved down her cheeks and his knowing gaze on her face burned her skin with shame. A mother, she was not. Suddenly, she pivoted and her left shoulder clipped hard into a muscle-bound man striding in her direction down the hallway. Her purse flung free of her shoulder and, like a pinata, exploded upon impacting the floor, launching her belongings across the tile like scattered pieces of hard candy. Uh, I'm so sorry. The man raised his arms apologetically. You should be. Lee frantically wiped tears from her face with the back of her hand as she scurried to the floor, rounding up her various lip balms and gum packs. I'm Gary, he said as he knelt to the floor. And I, she paused, can manage. Gary neatly piled her things and stood. Dr. Anderson delivered a communicative half-frown, and Gary understood immediately that this woman was not to be messed with, at least not right now. Are you sure you're okay? He felt compelled to ask, even in the face of added wrath. Yes, believe it or not, I'll manage without your chivalrous performance. Performance? He mouthed to himself in disbelief. Yes, performance, she said, apparently not hard of hearing. Whatever it is, he let her eyes elevate to his before continuing. It'll get better. Whether in time or with time, it will get better all the same. Did you memorize that from a Hallmark card, or are you just this naive? With that, she stuffed the remnants of her belongings into her purse, fastened the strap back over her shoulder, turned, and walked through the automatic doors of the hospital without looking back. She's a live one, Dr. Anderson said, moving towards Gary cautiously, as if approaching the scene of a car accident. Gary clenched his teeth and pulled a telling breath through them. It was the kind of breath one makes after breaking another's valuable or accidentally stepping on their dog. 
There is something in my office. I'll just be a moment, then we can talk. Okay. Gary knew this was the talk he had been trying to avoid since Nancy had come to this place. The hospitals back home were, well, much like the state of Maine itself, comfortable, clean, real, and generally less than impressive. This fact had led him, them, here. You call child services? We just can't. Gary heard a man's voice say from Dr. Anderson's office. Mere seconds later, the man exited the office. Are you sure? There is no going back, Dr. Anderson followed. The man, already past Gary in the hallway, threw a backhand up as if dismissing the statement. What was that all about? Gary, exacerbated, asked. Come on in. We should talk. Gary followed him into the office. The air was stifling, and as Gary sat down, he felt instantly trapped by the narrow arms of the chair. His mind wandered, and he could think of nothing better than simply seeing her. That was about a couple that just decided to relinquish adoptive rights to a very special four-year-old boy. But I imagine you'd prefer to discuss Nancy's status. Why exactly did they give him up? Temporarily distracted and desperately needing such distraction, Gary inquired. He has a condition called SIPA, and it carries a litany of dangerous everyday complications. And they couldn't deal with it? Couldn't? No, it was more of a choice not to. What happens to the boy? Now that he's diagnosed, he's essentially unadoptable. He'll be a ward of the state. God, that's awful. Awfully common, unfortunately. Dr. Anderson dropped his palm flat on a folder on his desk and slid it to the front. About Nancy, he said. His face went from serious to downright distraught, and Gary knew right then what was coming. This was not a moment kind to hope, or miracles, or the future. This was a meeting about the next few days, and whether Gary's wife would live to see them. He now expected she wouldn't. It's bad, Gary said. It wasn't truly a question. If they had discovered the lump a year or even six months earlier, then I could at least have given you some measure of hope. But at this point, she's stage four, Gary. It won't be long now. I'm so sorry. Gary leaned forward, grabbed the edge of the desk hard in his grip, and tried to squeeze the nausea clear of his throat and abdomen. His eyes pressed shut, and for a moment, the room spun. He breathed slowly. As he did, tears welled in his eyes. He dropped a close fist hard to the table with a loud roar of terror, frustration, and loss. With one controlled exhale, he calmly wiped his eyes, brushed the wrinkles free of his shirt, and asked, Can I see her? Hey, you, she said with a smile. She lay draped in a combination of pale hospital blankets and gowns. He told you, she said, and he watched as her eyes carefully inspected his face. He knew he couldn't hide from her. Hiding his dread from her was as fruitless as hiding a fresh ham bone in a dog kennel. Yeah, he said through the crackle of phlegm at the back of his throat. This wasn't news. I'm ready, she said. I'm not. That's what makes this all the more shameful. My selfishness. He kneeled down at her side, placing his palms lovingly on her arm. Her elbow was the one part of her body that the chemo hadn't changed. It was bony, devoid of meat like the rest of her, but unlike the rest of her, it had always been this way. He stroked her softly, trying to steer clear of the wires diving in and out of her body. Don't say that, she said soothingly. I'd have you live an eternity like this just to avoid losing you. How terrible is that? There's nothing terrible about you, Gary Daniels. Not one thing in this world. Do you have any regrets? Wish we had done anything? He asked. Just one. She reached forward with a shaky, angular arm and gently clutched hold of the nape of his neck. She reeled him in, kissed his ear softly, and whispered, I'd love to see you become a daddy.